Free agency is a fun little caveat in the NHL's collective bargaining agreement. On one hand, players with expiring contracts have the freedom to set themselves up, both financially and personally, as them and their agency fit. On the other, high-level executives, with Barrett's permission, have that cash, and for better or for worse, aren't afraid to spend it. Agents and GMs negotiate, players move from coast to province, we get story time with Brian Burke, all that stuff. In theory, this makes for actually good TV. Maybe even worthy of being called, uh... Um... What? What is it? Oh yeah, a frenzy! But it's not like that in real life, is it? No. Here's the NBA. Adrian Wojnarowski joins us now. <laughs> Here's the NHL. Not only does the NHL not know how to settle a salary cap number deep into June before their own draft, but they don't really get the idea of superstar player movement. Now recently, the needle has been moving. John Tavares signing with the Leafs last summer, Austin Matthews signing for just five years at a big money clip, Sebastian Ajo signing an offer sheet this summer. There's a player first mentality on the rise going into the 20s for sure. Who knows, maybe we'll actually get offer sheets that don't help the opposing GM save on the player's initial ask. Maybe someone will be an asshole for once, I don't know. But for the most part, it's still rare for true superstars to hit the unrestricted free agent market, and they're usually locked down by their teams way before that becomes a possibility. Whether that's out of age-old loyalty, personal comfort for the player, or just steep, steep, steep financial incentive, it waters down the quality of game-changing talent available and drives up the price of complimentary players. But if you thought that would stop NHL GMs from making bad decisions, you'd be f***ing wrong. David Clarkson, Matt Molson, Milan Lucic, Carl Alster, Jack Johnson. Long-term no. IR after three years. No. Miners by the end of the deal. Oh no, God! Miners by no. year two. Apparently more valuable than Olimata but objectively bad regardless. Who's Brandon Tanev? Dude's a role player on the Jets. What could he have possibly have gotten? What? Jim. 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 Jimmy Rutherford. Is this man your financial advisor? It's understandable that NHL GMs have a burning desire to make their respective teams better. Who wouldn't? But free agency is just not the place to empty your wallet to do it. Most of the time, the quality of player and dollar amount just doesn't add up to that one name that changes the course of your franchise for the better. You think the salary cap would prevent NHL GMs from spending money, money they, they don't, don't have, have on things, things they, they don't, don't need. need. But then you remember that Glenn Sather, let's just say he was dressed as Dick Tracy, that's fun for all of us, went into the offices at MSG one day, gathered his executives around the table, took a puff of a cigar, and then just let it out. You know what? Bobby Holik! Five years! 45 million! The Rangers in the 2000s were a prime example of all the money in the world not necessarily buying all the success. Post cap, it's even more punitive to convince yourself this will work out, especially with restricted free agents coming out of their entry level contracts wanting that. Case in point, the Vancouver Canucks. In 2016, Jim Benning signed Louis Erickson to a six year, $36 million deal. For some reason, his production has been self explanatory. In 2018, he signed not only Jay Beagle to four years and $12 million, but also fellow role player Antoine Roussel to four years and $12 million. For no reason. And then Roberto Luongo retired this summer, and the team now has to pay a penalty called Cap Recapture. You remember when the Devils tried to sign Ilya Kovalchuk to that insane 17-year, $102 million contract that paid him $98 million in the first 11 years and $4 million combined in the last 6 years, but somehow carried an annual cap hit of about $6 million? Yeah, the Canucks tried to do the same thing with Lou back in 2009, but for 12 years. They're gonna have to basically pay for the cap savings the contract gave them, which the league deemed to be about $3 million per season for the next three. Reddit user Chocolate Almond Fudge posted quite an extensive thread on this subject that I highly recommend you check out. Between Ericsson, Beagle, Roussel, and now this cap recapture penalty from Luongo, that's about 
15 million over the next three years that you'd probably like to put somewhere else. The cap recapture thing this year is pretty unfortunate, but before that, Jim, your team is drafted well. Stop. Let's take a look at who Vancouver will need to sign in that time span. Nikolai Goldobin, Brock Besser, Adam Gaudet, Elias Pettersson, and Quinn Hughes. Okay, right now, I can't find Jim Benning. I cannot reach him. I assume he's gone dark for the offseason. As I'm recording this, I hope this year he has not done anything too destructive. Please? I'm gonna have to cut this, aren't I? Now, Benning, or whoever replaces him, is probably gonna move Erickson's contract at some point. And generally, you could move a contract like this to clear up the books, but it's not easy. Nowadays, it is very expensive to pay for the right to pay expensive players. Look at Patrick Marlowe. Look at Calvin DeHaan. Not bad deals, but they were all moved for one expensive purpose. And because all these deals have some sort of no trade, no move, or no Canada clause attached, your own player you're trying to move has you in the palm of his hand and can say, No, I'm Nick Schmaltz's dad. And we're making your wildest dreams come no, true. Clayton Keller is oh, just give them all to me. Now, don't get me wrong. I take the player side in this. I fully support them getting paid and paid handsomely. I am against incompetent management. Making a splash when you don't have the pieces in place to fully contend or if your cup window is closed just doesn't work. But yet it happens almost every July first and beyond. Now every so often you might have one or two players that are worth putting the house on. Artemi Panarin is definitely one of them. But beyond the occasional unicorn, the true game changers don't exist. Those big name compliments are solid players in their own right. But is Kevin Hayes really worth more than Patrice Bergeron? No, not even if the man's taking a draw with a punctured lung, broken wrist, or shattered heart, or all of them combined. You can argue market value, but I argue incompetence. I don't know, maybe I'm being a bit naive, but it just boggles my mind to see the same thing happen over and over again, and fail over and over again. Maybe it's just the repetitive, mundane, stuck in your ways nature of the NHL that I just haven't grasped yet as a younger, idealistic viewer. Either way, NHL GM's doing dumb things. It's unfortunate, funny, and sad all at the same time. But free agency doesn't have to be this way. When that special GM takes a hard, realistic look at where the team might be at, whether they're kind of bottoming out, topping out, in the middle, looking to take that next step, maybe sells off some assets and builds some draft capital, maybe makes a few sneaky trades to speed things up, but ultimately, he understands what free agency is for. I love that shit. Joe Pavelski at three years and 21 million with the Dallas Stars. The term's perfect for the cup window. You saw what Ben Sagan and Radulov could do when they didn't have to do all the work. And his hand-eye coordination combined with the offensive instincts of those three defensemen is just a mutually beneficial relationship that is waiting to happen. Yunus Donskoy, four years and 15.6 million with the Avs. Miko Rantanen finally gets a buddy on the right side that can score and play D. Plus the deal expires at 31 rather than starts there. Richard Ponick at four years and 10 million with the Caps. Now the term's a little meh, but take into account that this guy scored 14 goals on a team that died halfway through last year. But seriously, he costs less than what Brett Conley would have, the advanced stats supporters analytical arguments, and given a good role, I could see him touching 20 as an important depth scorer on a team that's trying to win another cup. I also have a soft spot for those classic low risk prove it deals. I loathe, I loathe at Corey Perry at two years and 17.2 million. I tolerate Corey Perry at one year and one and a half million. I also like what the Devils did. Wayne Simmons at one year and five million is better than Wayne Simmons at five years and 25 million. It's a solid low risk bet for a bottom 10 power play that now has Jack Hughes, PK Subban, and should have a healthy Taylor Hall in a contract year. Like I said, I just have such a fascination for these types of deals because you get to see the player control his own fate and really see what they're made of. Finding a supporting role for a player at a cheap price and letting him succeed or fail, it's caution over concert. And really, that's how you play the free agent game. 
But of course a GM could do all of that. All of it! Just make the right signing, it's, it's a slam dunk, it's a home run, it's gonna work, and it just doesn't because of unfortunate circumstance, injury, or just downright dumb luck. God, do I hope James Neal's okay. You're never gonna have full foresight on any of this, and looking back, it's gonna be easy to pick apart the good and bad contracts equally, but in the league's current climate, where all these compliments are always overvalued for what they've done versus what they'll do, I'd argue the approach can lead to not only some savvy deals, but even the best deals. The ones you never make. As long as we have a CBA, unrestricted free agency isn't gonna go away anytime soon, and it'll always be the sexy way to upgrade your team without giving up traditional assets. But as we've seen, it can also be the dumbest, and sometimes it just doesn't make sense. But the main point, the, the main moral of the story that I want you to take away from this is don't be the Minnesota Wild. Jim, we just want to talk and prevent you from exercising fiscal irresponsibility. F*** you, dehumidifier. Jim, we just want to talk and prevent you from exercising fiscal irresponsibility. Come here. Been here. It's getting louder. It's not that bad, I mean, like, personally I wouldn't have done it and it's pretty f***ing obvious that he's trying to save his job at this point, but it's not as bad as it could have been. And maybe this cap situation isn't as bad as I thought. You know, I'm not that surprised. Bettings are unpredictable. One minute, they're drafting impeccably, and the next, they're pissing through the natural resources and paying for tall skyscrapers that do tall things because they're tall. What's that, not Jim? Fits in our culture. Fits in our culture? Where have I heard that before? Fits in our culture. Fits in our culture. Fits in our culture. Thank you.